Hi, I'm Mike Cutchins, Extension Dairy Specialist at the University of Illinois. Today's module will discuss forage definitions. Our learning objectives for this module, by the end of this presentation, you should be able to identify terms, abbreviations, and definitions used when testing forages and evaluating feedstuffs. Next, we should be determined how to apply these forage terms when evaluating forages on your farm. The first one is very straightforward, moisture. That's the amount of water that's in feed. Notice the hay, that's about 10% moisture. If it's directly coming out of the field, it's probably more like 20% moisture because it will sweat down. The next term is dry matter, which is just the reciprocal of moisture. So if I have a feed that is 10% uh, moisture, such as baled hay, 10 from 100 would be 90% dry matter, and feeds will all have moisture and dry matter. As fed refers to reporting that feed, including the water. So if you're doing a forage test results, it says as fed, that value will have reflect the amount of water. So the water dilutes down the protein content or the fiber content of that feed. Next is neutral detergent fiber, abbreviated as NDF. And that's really the picture of the cell wall. This pioneer picture shows you a schematic of it, and it will include those layers of cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. All three of them are NDF. Next come acid detergent fiber, ADF, and that basically corresponds to the cellulose and lignin part of the plant. So again, if you looked at that, that would be the green and the white areas here, and that's important because it impacts digestibility of the feed. To calculate fiber values, you can either analyze them chemically or you can do subtraction. If you subtract ADF from NDF, that's hemicellulose. That's the most digestible fraction of the cell wall itself. If you subtract lignin from ADF, that gives you cellulose. Lignin can be calculated uh, or it can be evaluated chemically. And ADF can be treated with sulfuric acid and the residual product would be lignin. So again, you can either chemically analyze these or you can do it by difference. You'll have two terms, non-fiber carbohydrates, known as NFC, or non-structural carbohydrates. Both of these are rapidly and more completely digested fractions of the plant material, and depending on uh, the type of these, will determine its rate. In these two, we'll look at the cell contents. NFC, or non-fiber carbohydrates, is calculated, and that is 100 minus percent crude protein minus the percent NDF minus the percent ash or mineral minus the percent fat. So any air made in the analyses will just compound this number as well. Non-structural carbohydrates reflects starch and sugar, and these can be either calculated or chemically analyzed. This table comes from NRC, compares different NFC fractions. I'll not walk you through them, but you can see how variable this NFC fraction can be. For example, if you look at corn silage, extremely high in the starch and volatile fatty acids compared to beet pulp, which has lots of sugar and lots of pectin. So this is the percent of the NFC expressed as either one of those four fractions. The trick, of course, is to balance these out in your feeding program. Sugar is a rapidly fermented carbohydrate. You can see the sources listed there for you. These can be identified by NIR analyses here or a chemical analysis as well. Powerful tool in building rations. Another source, of course, is starch. Starch varies depending on the source of starch and how it's being processed. And it can vary a great deal. Critical because it reflects the amount of fermentable carbohydrates coming in the rumen. And if we get it wrong, we can have problems with our dairy animals. Here shows a schematic of the fermentation rates. You can see wheat is very fast, where sorghum is very slow. And then on the right side, depends if you steam flake, it makes it very fast, where if you go to a dry rolled or process, it goes slower. So farmers and nutritionists can change rates of starch degradation depending on its source and its form. Next is pectin. Pectin is part of the cell wall, but is included in the NFC fraction. It rapidly ferments and therefore it falls in that category there. The good news is it produces acetic acid instead of propionic acid contributed by starch, for example. TDN stands for total digestible nutrients. This is the sum of digestible fiber, protein, lignin, and carbohydrates. It's an old term. Many of us grew up looking at balancing rations energetically based on TDN. 
and it's directly related to digestible energy in the other system. Generally, TDN overestimates the energy value of forages or roughages. RFV, it's an index that ranks cool season legumes and grasses based on their potential for dry matter digestibility and intake. You see the formula on the bottom. Uh, the key here, you can see it's really driven by ADF and NDF. And so be aware of that with RFV. So it's a ranking program. The new measurement is relative feed quality, known as RFQ, developed by the University of Wisconsin. The beauty of this program is that it took RFV and now uses NDF digestibility. So now we are looking at the quality of the fiber rather than just the percent of the chemical fiber. You can see the formulas listed here. You can explore those at your leisure if, if you wish. But again, another new term that you'll see on Forge test results. Another one is NDF digestibility, known as NDFD. You will see different hours with this, 30 hour and 48 hour. Uh, this is based on the amount of time that that forage was exposed to an in vitro or in situ a methodology that would be the wet chemistry. We can now see this with NIR technology. The 30 hours is the typical time that this feed stays in the digestive tract. 48 hours has a much lower variation you'll see here in just a minute. You may also see it 24 hours, and that's more commonly associated with corn silage. This schematic shows you how the 48 hours on the right, the variation of these analyses are greatly reduced, where at 30 hours or 24 hours, it has a much wider variation. So you can decide which one of these values you want to use. I like 30 hour. New terms is UNDF stands for undigestible NDF. INDF is indigestible NDF. These analyses are based on 120 or 240 hour analyses of the NDF digestibility and they can be related to very nicely to fill factors and are very valuable in computer software programs because now you can look at the slope of the line, determine how fast a given forage breaks down. One guideline from the minor institution is we should be looking at about 0.35 to 0.45% of the cow's body weight as UNDF, which is fill factors. So again, you can determine how much of this forage may be consumed by those cattle. Here's another uh, example coming from Dairyland Labs, looking at the different values. You can study these at your leisure. You can see that the best curve is BMR, means it have the lowest level. Here you want low, you want a low value, low UNDF. But you have to have some value because that is what makes the rumen very, very healthy. And if you slip over there, you can see my grasses and my legumes tend to have a higher level of UNDF. And this would be a very futuristic tool we'll be using here in building rations, determining dry matter intake. The next one comes from Rock River Lab in the University of Wisconsin. It's known as TTNDFD, stands for Total Track NDF Digestibility. And it just is a standard way to look at both the rates and the levels of digestibility, be very powerful in models. It has a totally different number compared to other ones, so be very careful which system you are going to be using and evaluating your forages. The magic number is 48. Another one you'll see at times is known as in vitro, that means outside of the cow, dry matter digestibility, which means we have taken rumen fluid, mix it with your forages, and that would be the wet chemistry. So this is in vitro dry matter digestibility. That's the same way as we get in vitro NDF digestibility. Just be sure you know which one is dry matter and which ones are going to be fiber values. Energy calculations, be well aware energy are all calculated. The only way you can actually measure that is to put a cow or a steer into an enclosed chamber and measure all the temperatures, the gases, and excretia and product coming from the cow. Here are some of the terms you're going to see, and they'll be in various combinations. You'll see net energy lactation versus net energy gain versus net energy maintenance. That is the function of how we use energy. In dairy cattle, net energy lactation, net energy maintenance are almost identical. 1x versus 3x means the level of intake. 1x is maintenance. Dry cows. 3x would be a cow that's probably producing about 60, 70 pounds of milk. So now the level of dry matter intake will change energy values. Already talked about TDN. You'll see that pop up there. That's a calculated number. Another one you'll find is known as ORAC. Or it stands for the Ohio State Summative Equation. And that's probably the most powerful one on the list here because now we're actually looking at digestibilities 
of the various fractions going into that equation coming from the NRC. Another one you'll see with corn silage, and that is known as a Schwab shaver number, and that will take is based on the OARDC number, but then also adjusted for dry matter, which means wetter silages get more energy than dry silages, and kernel processing. Kernel processed will have higher energy values. Wet chemistry, that we've talked a bit earlier about that. This means that these nutrients are based on some type of a chemical analysis. For example, ether extract for fat. Keldol for proteins. It's considered the gold standard. They're very expensive. They take time. And basically, your NIR analysis is based on wet chemistry results. That gets us to the next one, NIR, near-infrared analysis, which means that we shoot a light beam across this feed sample that's been ground and processed, and then that's been associated with a chemical analysis. And so it has seen this silage or this forage or this hay before and can estimate it. So it's very quick. Quick analysis, a very inexpensive analysis, can be done in less than one day, but the key is you need to have a very accurate calibration set when you start doing this type of analyses because it, it has to have seen this before and just repeats the, the, the light array. In vitro, as we mentioned earlier, means outside of the cow. This can be done with fish related animals. In vivo or in situ means we are now taking a sample of your feed, putting it into a Dacron bag, allows the feed to be uh, digested micron size, about 40 microns. The bacteria and fluids can get in and we can actually digest the feed. This is really expensive because you're going to put in a series of bags to determine rate constants. Crude protein stands for the nitrogen that's in the feedstuff multiplied by 6.25. So it's a very common analysis. You're going to see these other ones, acid detergent soluble nitrogen, acid detergent soluble protein, acid detergent soluble crude protein. These are all adjustments that are used in models. So we're looking at such things as heat damage that's occurring, and in some cases we're correcting also for the amount of soil. NPN stands for non-protein nitrogen. You won't see this very common in many forage test results. This reflects any protein that is not in the amino acid form and that would be probably evaluated again by NIR analysis. Soluble protein is that portion of the crude protein that goes into solution. Usually we're using a buffered solution or some other type of media, or in some cases, water. This rapidly breaks down and is utilized by the bacterium. Ether extract, it re represents that factor of uh, fat and oils in a diet. So ether extract includes fats, oils, and some of the waxes and other products out there. And that is a very common analysis there. So in many cases, either extract, fats, and oils are used interchangeably on some of the lab results. Fat chemically uh, is a triglyceride containing three fatty acids. It's a very dense source of energy, and it is solid at room temperature. Lactic acid is one of the strong acids that's produced during the silage fermentation process. This is actually the acid that pickles your silage and drops the pH. Typically, we're expecting to see values of 3 to 6% lactic acid in silage fermentations. Acetic acid comes from the aerobic phase of the fermentation process, usually the first two to three to four days, unless it's improperly ensiled or it's too dry, and this number normally is around 1 or 2%, and has some advantage in terms of extending bunk life, and is found in some of the new inoculants because it produces a heterothermic fermentation. Propionic acid, not very common on that. You can see it's in very small proportions, uh, less than one-tenth of one percent. So unless you're adding a specific inoculant to produce it, it will not be there. Butyric acid, especially with alfalfa and legume and grass silages, is a clostridial fermentation. This is bad news. You'd like to see this down below 0.5%. You'd have to have action. If it's 0.5, it's normally should be under 0.1% butyric acid if it's got the right dry matter, the right stage of maturity, and a good inoculant on it. This can be very dangerous based on Wisconsin research. Organic acids, also known as VFAs, are basically fermented in the silo and therefore has been spent. So therefore, it has no value to rumen microbes, although your dairy cattle can absorb those through the rumen wall as a source of energy. Here are some guidelines from the University of Wisconsin and the University of Delaware that you'd find for various types of acids in fermented corn silage, legume silage, grass silage, and high moisture corn. Another test you'll see, especially in corn silage, 
will be nitrate nitrogen. Simply, we express the nitrate levels as actual N. Be very careful because you can also have it reported as nitrate. And you'll see the conversion is you divide the nitrate by 4.4 and then you have nitrate nitrogen. Be really sure which type of analysis is being performed on your forages. So what's our take home messages? Well, a lot of information covering in this module, our apologies for that, but there's a lot of terms. And the trick is you need to understand how they apply to your forage quality. You also have to relate how these forage tests will impact your dairy ration. And then finally, be ready to interpret forage test results from various forages such as legume, grasses, and corn silages. Thanks. Have a great day.